now with the fourth topic, which is the system. What is the system and is the world a system? Well, I suppose that depends what you mean by world and what you mean by system. Right. <laughs> if, <laughs> Very easy questions. If you, yeah. If you mean by world planet, the planet doesn't exist. Right? There's no planet. Are you a flat earther? <laughs> no. No, no, no. No, no, no. no. Careful. So the, the planet uh, is a system, but the planet is not in it for itself. It, it's nothing to itself. Uh, the planet is an abstraction. Flat Earth, by the way, is also an abstraction. Okay. So what Flat Earth uh, understands is that no one lives on a planet. You know, you and I, when we go outside, we don't see, oh, yes, I'm walking on planet Earth. Mm. No, you're walking in your hometown or another town or a village on a path that you know you don't know. Uh, and it may be familiar or foreign to you. But it, your immediate life world is not planet Earth. But that's could... a complete abstraction. What flat Earth does, or this uh, the idea of the flat Earth does, is is to see that there's something wrong with this abstraction, and they end up in another abstraction, which is that it's not a sphere, but it's a it's plane, a, a flat. Or, or what what is the word? A plane or a like plane, a... A, 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 yeah. Okay. So both of them are abstractions. Uh, and in some sense, the world, so the planet as planet, that is to say, in this, mm, I would say really here in that case, I would really say construction of it is assumed to be a system that is manageable, controllable and steerable. Yes. All right. But it isn't. But it isn't. <laughs> How would you then separate the understanding of world from the understanding of the planet? Would you say world is something as maybe Heidegger would put it, something that has this sort of radius of unknownness beyond it, that needs to have that in order to be a world. So world used to mean cosmos, which means closed off, a well-ordered whole. That's cosmos, that's world. With the explosion into the infinite, world in that sense as cosmos disappears the ever expanding universe is no longer a well-ordered uh, world so when we once we get to the early heidegger and and also of course husserl welt or world <clears throat> comes to mean the horizon against which beings appear as meaningful and as you say also there is to speak in this uh, language if there's something ultimately not completely inaccessible but there's something inexhaustible to it and what the let's say the world as system or the planet as system must assume is that it is fully exhaustible meaning it can be fully seen and these what that's why you have attempts by the european union for example to build a computer that can simulate the entirety of the globe uh, it, it would exhaust by the way at this point all the co calculating capa computing capacity that's available in the world right um but uh, we can see here in order to to achieve the, the planet as system what is required is a simulation so the actually what they're after the planet disappears okay so uh, in order for it to be understood as a system it needs to be simulated and closed off so yeah. In a way, like systems, for example, in general systems theory of Luhmann is described as a difference between environment and the system. So it's kind of a recursive definition in a sense. But there is this like notion of there is a separation and you can only, from within the system, you can only generate information within it. So it's operationally closed. That means um, the environment can never be understood as such. It can only be understood of how it enters the system. Yeah. Um, so could you draw analogies to that understanding of world that you brought forward or cosmos that you brought forward? Or would you say in order to actually have an authentic encounter with the world, you need to really, you know, overcome, verwinden the notion of a system altogether? Um, hmm. Well, like, in philosophy the notion of system has disappeared 
there is no system philosopher after Hegel. There is, and, and that has this specific reason also, because with, with Hegel, there is to a certain degree that the death of philosophy occurs. Mm -hmm. um, it has exhausted itself, but you described also, um, your question went a bit different direction, but the, what you described with Luhmann comes back to, I think what we said in the first uh, conversation, which you know, is science after truth. And we said, well, it's really at this point about manipulation or trying to get the result. And this is exactly what this sort of syst you know, systematizing the planet as a simulation <clears throat> goes towards that it doesn't reach out back into uh, or, or cannot really, uh, if it wants to predict, it needs to mm, uh, uh, generate a simulation of its of itself, as it were, this simulation, in order to predict what it is that it needs to uh, predict. I mean, predict has a weird meaning, right? Because it doesn't just mean to predict what might happen, but to say what what will happen. Uh, and it it, but we don't need so we need to get rid of any words. I mean, the, the words or the notions get rid of themselves, as it were, uh, once we begin to think. So does it make, would it make sense to have a system philosophy after 200 years of, of having none? Uh, no, I think it has probably exhausted itself. And we can again come back to the LARP and we can have a, mm -hmm. a, a LARP uh, system uh, philosophy. Um, but so there's no need to get rid of anything because usually the, what is no longer, what no longer says much uh, rids itself um, and gets rid of itself. So, mm, okay, yeah. I, uh, that sounds familiar to like something. Are you familiar with Alexander Kojev? Yeah. He, uh, he, as far as I understand it, uh, he also kind of claimed that Hegel, in a sense, was the last philosopher, or in that sense, and that any philosophy you're trying to create after that is a form of LARP that can be embedded with embedded and then disproven within. Uh, and negated within a Hegelian framework. <laughs> yes and no. Uh, I think Kojev misunderstand. And so again, this has to do with, with a certain language or so. Uh, what uh, Mr. Kojev perhaps doesn't. So what he wants to see is that in, there is an end of history in Hegel. I don't think that that's necessarily um, the case. I think that uh, <clears throat> we could say that what Hegel pr provides, by the way, Hegel speaks of Fortschritt in, in, in the introduction to the science of logic. He says, as we progress, as we march forward, we are getting closer to the origin. So the idea that is at the end, but is not presupposed, that the, the thinking here arrives at, would, so it would be a return to the source. So that's a completely different understanding of Hegel right? and also of his so-called a philosophy of of history in some sense it comes to a completion a certain project mm -hmm. but at the same time you would have one would have to say that it is also um while it is a completion um i think guess i Spengler would probably say that in the in completion there's death and probably Kujev says it from a different angle um but i think that this is an invitation so as it comes fully, what I think really what happens with Hegel is that philosophy becomes conscious of itself. Okay. And as it becomes fully aware of itself, it's it, that's an invita that's an invitation to not to say it's it's done it's over, but to to find to find ways of accessing the tradition again. So that it genuinely speaks to us as Hegel's philosophy spoke, as he would have to agree, spoke to the people of his epoch. So in some sense, history is ending all the time. Okay. The world ends every 10 seconds, if you like. <laughs> it can end every minute when someone dies. That's when a world ends. The world ended in, 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 the, in the, the second that the thought of the of of judgment day or so it, it, it became uh, thinkable that's when the so the history yes history ends from time to time it ends so that it but the end is in a spiral movement uh or a circle of circles as hegel calls it is not simply 
uh, you know, if we think of just end as, as an end point, mm -hmm. no. End is a fruition and completion. Of a cycle. Or well, of let's, a, yeah, let's say of a, of a, of a cycle or of a, a spiral movement that then spirals out into something other. Right. But, but from, with, and, and, you know, you, 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 you take some of it with you and some of it you leave behind. But it's only in the, in the completion that you, you look back and see what, the, what has been. Mm -hmm. And that then stretches and echoes forth. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen this thought mirrored in, I, I even made a video myself uh, where I called them the Archon and the Katekon, where it's like, Katekon, uh, yeah, yeah where, where it's like, it seems like what we're approaching is a sort of mirror image of what lies at the source in the past in a way so it's a, in, a, in a way we're returning to something yeah in a, in a big cycle which also has been mirrored by um i mean I, have you heard of um uh, teilhard de jardin who is um, he is actually he was a uh, i think a jesuit priest who actually interestingly um is an inspiration to a lot of transhumanist thought. Uh, he was a Catholic who was considered a bit of a heretic for accepting and embracing evolution too yeah. much. Yeah. And he had this notion of the alpha and the omega point, where it's like the 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 um, Big Bang was the alpha point and the end point is the omega point, yeah. which is both the realization of God, in a sense. So and uh, I'm looking for a pen. There's no pen here. Give me your, give me your thing here. So alpha and omega. Mm. Right. I don't know if anyone can see. It's probably too small. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> alpha. I know. I'm. I mean, a bit of a trickery. Because this is alpha, and this is omega. I mean, you flip the alpha. Uh, it, it it almost looks as omega. Yeah. Uh, so in 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 the alphabet of the Greeks, um, and they were much more concerned with the, the shape of the letters than we are today we just skip over them and think of them not at all um, but the alpha also look at it, it is a circle that is also open so it, it opens just like the omega is a circle that is also completely open so when it when you get to omega you know it you, you fall out of it again uh, and whereas here you you're given two directions uh that the alpha could could go to uh, and I think the weird thing about our time is, thank you, uh, is that we could, that, 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 that we see all of this. That's the strange thing. Everything's, we know that this is a certain historical epoch. The Greeks don't think in terms of epochs. They don't even think in terms of beginnings or endings. For Heraclitus, the cosmos is uncreated. It has no beginning. It has no end. Um, similar for Aristotle in a very different way, but still the, the unmoved mover. Uh, is not the beginning, is not the end in any sort of uh, uh, historical movement. Right. So, and but we seem we are. This is the. It's so obvious that it is. It's too obvious in a sense. Einstein famously tried to cram it into his theory of general relativity. He tried to famously add the uh, cosmological constant so that the cosmological theory of the universe was static and yep. uh, was not created and expanding but then he considered it a big mistake uh, as it right. was discovered that it was expanding uh, famously so which gave the whole thing a kind of epoch epochal which, structure which by the way is not scientific right expanding is 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 the mode of being of the faustian spirit so it, it finds that expansion everywhere it's again it's it's geschichte it's history okay interesting <laughs> Interesting. So, <laughs> not not narrative, not interpretation, but in a way, and this is where it gets a bit spooky. No one, you know. So, we we respond, and as we respond to these different dimensions of which we are a part, but not only, something changes within them. That's what Heidegger means by Ereignis. It's not some event that might come. Blah blah blah. No no. There are shockwaves that, that are sent back through our responses, poetic, artistic, mm -hmm. uh, linguistic, technical responses. And they probably really cut or shift and shape uh, the gestalt of what we so benignly call the expanding universe. So th that's, yeah, because that, that would actually put the human being in a, in a very specific position. It's not the human beings do not create the universe. 
but human beings do have do influence in a way that no other probably to our knowledge um animals or so do and so in in the weirdest way that one you know and let we have to think in a weird way because everything else is very boring mm -hmm. perhaps the universe really was enclosed and it's not that the, the greeks got it wrong but it's the minute that the, the the relationship to what we call the universe becomes a different one that it begins to expand and it may just as well come back to the conclusion and if you look at the images of what nasa now believes that the universe looks like it actually looks much like what aristotle thought that it is bound up ultimately but expanding within okay so it, it's it is finite or it has a limit but within that it's expanding there's an infinite pos there's endless possibilities or at least uncountable possibilities within a certain limitation okay this has gone this has <laughs> gone this has gone into some depths there um i'm gonna try and um bring it a bit back to the notion of a system here and <laughs> and uh one one famous um a comment that Gotthard Günther made for example on f philosophical systems is that there is an attempt um at which one tries to cram a philosophical uh, f uh, to cram the world into a particular end of a binary for example let's take uh, idealism versus materialism the attempt is to see the entirety of the world as a system of idealism yeah. where the environment is the material and you're trying to reduce it all into that system by denying the material by saying that environment is nothing because the system's everything and that's this this sort of thing and and the more extreme you do it the more you and reach that point where it inverts and you can see the entire thing from the opposite view and it works just as well by positioning everything in the world as matter and having the idealist the kind of mental parts just be a contingent byproduct so i, I find it kind of hilariously mirrored in history in the tra transition from hegel to marx where you just get the hegelian system just flipped and it works kind of in a similar way and um so the 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 point i'm making here is is the system overcome when you come to that point again where you like you, you know you walk through the system you you think through the system and then you end up at the point seeing your your own back of your head in a, in a way you know what i mean uh, is that the point where you've overcome is it is it do we need to get go through this whole acceleration of the universe let's say uh, you know study study the acceleration to the end to arrive back at the static universe Well, as Master Eckert once said, why do you go out in order to return home? And the das Urbild des Europäischen Menschen, so the primordial image of European man, is Odysseus, who goes out in order to air home. Takes him a long time. <laughs> but eventually... <laughs> he comes home scarred, 